morning, everybody. I'm a grateful owl, and my name is Carrie. Hi, Carrie. You guys are great. Early, early Saturday morning. Uh, I was sitting down there just a minute ago. It's a little early, and my coffee hadn't kicked in yet. And I thought, boy, it's early in the morning. And then all of a sudden, when everybody started reading, I get that familiar. My heart doing like this, so we're all good now. Still a little. My heart's racing. In a few minutes, it'll slow down. Uh, I'm thankful to be here today. It's a, always an honor and a privilege to be asked to share my story of recovery and. Uh, any Al Anon or AA meeting or roundup or wherever I go, and I want to thank the committee for inviting me and and a great room basket, just wonderful hospitality. Thank you for letting me be here today. Uh, is anybody here in Al Anon for their first year? Could you raise your hand? Just just so I, welcome. I want to welcome uh, all the newcomers, or even if you're new in AA for your first year, I want to welcome you to the twelve step way of life. Uh, I hope that you find in this program the freedom and the serenity and the spiritual awakening I've found. It changed my life. It gave me a life. I was spiritually bankrupt when I got here, so I hope that you can find something, and I hope that uh, me being here today can share a little bit of hope for you. Um, I, I May 17th of next month, I'll celebrate my 23rd Allen on birthday, um, which is <laughs> truly by God's grace, because I don't think I've ever done anything except show up and breathe every day for that long. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, raised, born and raised in a, in a little community in Mississippi, a little farming community. I was born and raised on a 500-acre cotton and soybean farm out in the middle of nowhere, south of Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, it was really far out. I was not raised in active alcoholism. There was no drinking in my home growing up. I was raised and affected by family disease of alcoholism, but there was no drinking in my house. I didn't know this until I arrived in the rooms of Al-Anon. I was very, very sick by the time I got here, and I didn't even know what was wrong with me. Today, I think it's like trying to tell a fish that it's in water. <laughs> you know, how could you know that you're in something that you've been in all your life? Like, what's air, right? Um, at any rate, <laughs> excuse me, we were out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I'm what, 47 years old. Yeah, I'll be 48 in December. We didn't have a phone in our community until I was like 12 years old. Now, it was really like even more far back than Dukes of Hazard. It was tra- kind of like the Beverly Hillbillies where I lived, you know. <laughs> we had a family farm. We lived next door to my grandparents. And uh, my dad was a the baby. There were three kids, and, and my father was the only one that lived near. And we worked the farm together with my grandparents. And my grandmother was an untreated al Now, a lot of these words and terms I didn't know until I got into the rooms. But she had been raised, and I can remember she was a great storyteller. She would tell us stories about her stepdad, who was a drinker. They didn't use the term alcoholic, but they would talk about him drinking. She would tell stories of how he would come and call softball games for him, umpire the softball games, and the longer the game went, the drunker he would get, and they would get in fights with the other team because he would make bad calls, and she was taking up for her stepdad. And and then at night, sometimes they would go out, and they used wagons at that point with mules, you know, to plow the field and haul the wagons and they would take his wagon apart piece by piece and hang it from the tree and he would never know because he'd be so drunk and he'd get up in the morning and see and they just thought it was in great fun and I thought it was fun too until I got here and I'm like wow that's kind of messed up you know <laughs> but that's what I come from my father um he never really severed the emotional umbilical cord from my grandmother he was like the baby even as an adult my family didn't have very good boundaries so my mom married my dad when she was 16. I was 18. I, I, she was 18 when she had me. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was. I get backwards sometimes. I'm a little nervous yet, so it's good. We're all laughing. We're having a good time, right? <laughs> so my mom was a kid, essentially, when she married my dad. She was 16, and I was born two years later. And when I was, I think I was like seven years old when they divorced. Looking back now, to me, it's kind of like my mom, my dad, and my grandmother was one too many people in that marriage, you know? It should only be two, and there was three. And uh, so my mom moved back to where her mother lived. My, my mom's mom was a paranoid schizophrenic, and I didn't know what that meant until I got older, but there's a lot of dysfunction in my family. So when my parents divorced, it was pretty shocking to me. I thought my mom had just abandoned me, and so I didn't want to leave home. My dad got custody of us, and I didn't want to go visit my mom. Honestly, as a small child, I was afraid if we left home, when I came back, maybe my dad wouldn't be there. So I had this huge abandonment wound that I walked around with until I was way into recovery. What a big victim, you know. It was good training for getting here in al At any rate, <laughs> I was supposed to be the firstborn. I wasn't. I mean, I, I, my father wanted a son to be the... 
and I wasn't a boy, but he raised me like one. So I got my first shotgun when I was eight, and he taught me to hunt and fish and chew tobacco and play ball and all that good stuff, and I thought it was great. He got a little upset later on when I went a little farther with that than he liked, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like I planned it, you know. I mean, it just happened. At any rate, uh, I, I love growing up on a farm. I mean, we were outdoors all the time, you know, and hunting and fishing and learning to fix things, and it was just wonderful. There was a lot of freedom. I was grateful for that freedom because my father remarried right away uh, after he divorced my, my mom. And my stepmother, didn't know this then, so much of this is in hindsight, my stepmother was an adult child of an alcoholic, but I didn't know that. Uh, what I knew is shortly after they married, it seemed like we were in competition for my father's love. Excuse me. And she began being emotionally abusive to me. And she would tell me that if I told anybody, it would be worse when my father was out of the house. And he was a farmer. He was out, you know, a lot. And he also happened to be a compulsive gambler who played poker and dice a lot. But, you know, we didn't talk about that much. Uh, At any rate, I had no reason to believe that she wasn't telling me the truth. So I kept secrets. And I began to shut down and just pretend. And this was very good, making me sicker to get ready to get to the rooms of Alamont. Well... Not too long after the emotional abuse started, she began to get physically abusive with me. And again, she would tell me if I told anybody, it would be worse next time. So I learned early on that if I just put on a face, a smiling face, and told you everything was okay and everything was fine, that you would believe me and we would just go on like nothing happened. Well, I learned to be numb. I learned to not acknowledge my feelings. I learned to go against my instincts. Um childhood I I spent most of my time trying to be outside because I didn't want to be at home with my stepmother when I was 15 years old my grandfather died he lived just across the the, we lived I could throw a rock and hit their house and uh, I remember that distinctly because we I blow my hair dry one morning and the phone rang and we hadn't had a phone very long you know and the, the phone rang in the morning and we ran across to my grandmother's house and I can remember turning my grandfather's head over he had blue eyes the only one in our family that had blue eyes And at 15, I watched the life leave his body. And that's a very, very intense, powerful, tragic thing to have witnessed at 15. And I can remember I was so concerned with being strong for the family that I couldn't cry in front of them. Because my grandmother was upset, my dad was upset. And about two, three weeks later, I went to where I had been uh, squirrel hunting with my grandfather recently before he died and finally was able to cry after two or three weeks and it just everything just came out just let it go let it go but I couldn't see I couldn't let anybody see me do that because that was we were supposed to be strong crying was a sign of weakness and you didn't do that in my family so I uh, went to college my father told me that if I wanted to go to school I had to get a scholarship because he couldn't afford to pay for me to go to school I was a softball jock you know all star I wanted to get a softball scholarship and I say that I have a disease of perception. I wanted to get a softball scholarship because I thought that would be cool, you know, to be a jock. And uh, they didn't give very good softball scholarships. So I had to resort to a four-year fully renewable academic scholarship that paid for everything. And I thought that was like a step down, you know. (laughs) See, it's a disease of perception, you know. I mean, it's the way I look at things. It's just a little twisted, you know. Um, And, you know, we laugh and uh, you hear people talk about the alcoholics being sick. But think about this. Alanons do those crazy things and they don't even have to take a drink, you know. I mean, who's really the sicker ones? We are. (laughs) But uh, I got to college, and I was at college for maybe, I don't know, six weeks. Now, when I was growing up, there were no words for people like me. I didn't know what that meant even like me. I just knew my insides were different than the girls that I played with. But I didn't know what that meant because I was so cut off from everything. Well, I got to school, and I found out what that meant. I went to a women's college, (laughs) and there were a lot of gay women there. And uh, I sought them out very quickly, and it didn't take me, but, you know, like that, to get into a relationship. And uh, I was in a relationship uh, with my first partner for a couple years. And here's where I like to say, really, I was in the same relationship for 10 years, but the faces just kept getting different, you know. I mean, (laughs) there was no time in between any of them. I would just leave one go right into another. No no introspection, no looking at myself, just, you know. And usually I kind of had one on the line a little bit before I even let the next one go, you know. (laughs) But I didn't officially be unfaithful to any of them because that would be beneath me, you know. (laughs) <laughs> Anyways, uh, I, my, right before I finished college, my father ha- and um, stepmother, oh, wow, I missed some stuff in my childhood. Let me back up just for a second here. When I was uh, 12 years old, we were way out in the country. I told you that already. We, all we did was like hunt and fish, play ball, and, and drink and have sex out there, right? <laughs> And there's not a lot to do. And so when I was 12, we had the family car, and a whole group of us kids went out one night. And I was seeing this little boy that my father didn't want me seeing, and uh, I lost my virginity that night to him. 
Well, on the way home, my stepbrother, who was two years older than me, he raped me. But because of my disease of perception, I didn't know that what he was done had done was worse than what I had done earlier. And I thought that I would get in trouble for what I had done if I told on him. So I didn't, and I just kept another secret. So for a couple more years, every night when I would go to bed, I tried to go to bed before my parents did so I could go to sleep, because if I didn't, I would be so filled with fear that I lay awake till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, afraid that my stepbrother would come into my room. That's really not a way for a teenager to live at all, you know, but uh, it's that's what my childhood was like. And a couple years later, uh, in, in the two years that passed, I would manipulate and control situations so that the adults didn't know that I didn't want to be around my stepbrother. That's pretty difficult to do when you live in the house with someone, but it just shows you how distorted and and messed up I got because I was so focused on doing that. I became a master manipulator, and a couple years after that, it happened again, and this time I told. My father made him leave, and my stepmother just got her, her abuse just got worse at that point, which is about the time that my grandfather died. And I got to move in with my grandmother, which was so wonderful because my grandmother, we called her Big Mama. And uh, she was probably weighed about 120 pounds soaking wet, but she was bigger than life. I mean, she ran our whole family. She was the matriarch. And uh, no one bothered me while I was around her. So I, I enjoyed being able to live with her. And I went to college, got to college, started getting into relationships. <laughs> Did really well in college and, and uh, was really enmeshed in my relationship. Excuse me. I don't used to eat that close to speaking. Uh, so <laughs> it's messing me up a little bit here. And so um, right before my senior year of college, my dad and my stepmother had moved to, to Dallas, Texas. They were no longer farming. They were driving truck cross country. And my stepmother was really nice to me now that I didn't live at home anymore. And I found out that uh, my stepmother had cancer. She was really sick. And my father brought her home to my grandmother to live to be nursed to death because he didn't have any health insurance. He was in between jobs or whatever. And so my grandmother was nursing my stepmother. I was in college. And the last semester of my college, I was getting ready to take the MCATs to go to medical school because I was smart. I for sure would have gotten into medical school. And my mom's mom, paranoid schizophrenic, died. And two weeks after that, my stepmother died. And it was my final semester of college. And something in me, it was just like a chip blew in my brain or something and I couldn't I just couldn't function and I and I knew it t- couldn't take the MCATs and so I said well I think I'll just go with my partner my second I was on my second relationship at that point I'll just move with her to Los Angeles because she's going out there because why not it sounded like a good idea this little redneck had not been west of Dallas Texas okay and I said oh heck I'll just move to LA well that was a geographic but I didn't know the word for it at that time you know my family thought I was crazy because I loaded up my little brown pinto and here we go driving out to LA you know <laughs> <laughs> Mississippi has one interstate. It runs from the north to the south to the, to the south end of the, uh, the state, and it's two lanes each side. You've been to San Bernardino where there's like ten lanes on each side, you know? It's crazy. I'm out there going, oh, my God, what did I do? And no one can understand me because my drawl is so thick, and I talk in complete colloquialisms, and no one knows what I'm saying, and they're all hurting my feelings because they're being rude at this little redneck, you know? So I get out there, and I get a job, and I do what I do. Uh, I don't know how to communicate with my partner because I wouldn't know a feeling if, or how to say that I had a feeling if it hit me over the head. And so things, uh, you know, life starts to happen. And I can't talk, I can't communicate, I can carry on a conversation, but I can't tell you how I really feel or if I have a need. I don't know what a need is because I think you're supposed to fix it, you know, without me telling you. You're supposed to read my mind. And so I uh, had gotten a job and there was this cute little thing that, that uh, worked where I did and I started getting interested. And, you know, I'm a person of ethics and morals and I come home and tell my partner that I want to date somebody else so I want to break up with her and she has to move. I didn't th- see anything wrong with that. <laughs> Bludgeoning people with the truth was not something I was r- really schooled on at that point, you know, and we learned in program to be compassionate, and I didn't know much about that at that point. So I got uh, continued in these relationships, and, and one right after another, and uh, finally I found myself <coughs> unhappy with a, a gal that drank a lot and did cocaine, and she had a little baby, and, and uh you know, the drinking wasn't too bad, but the cocaine kind of tipped me right over the edge, you know, because I would be going to bed to sleep and getting ready to, you know, needing to go to work the next day, and she wouldn't come in, and the baby would be crying all night because cocaine makes you do some crazy things. And uh, so I finally left that relationship in a, in a dramatic fashion. It's so funny to me because I don't know if there are any other al like this in this room, but I want to make out like it's the alcoholic who's dramatic, you know? Yeah, you don't corner of the market I'm being dramatic we're dramatic in our own right you know I can remember slinging the shower curtain back while she's in the shower saying what's this in your purse it was cocaine I was like I told you if I found this again I was going to leave you know and so I leave and 
And then uh, I proceed <laughs> in my very dysfunctional way of, of talking to people to find out all the lies that she'd been telling me because I just had to know. I don't know if you guys do that at all or used to, but <laughs> got to find out all the dirt. And in the process of me doing this to, to just have a little more drama in my life, I bumped into uh, a person who was two years sober in A&A. Well, I just moved to L.A. I knew what AAA was, but I didn't know what AA was, you know. <laughs> and they tell me that this person was sober in Alcoholics Anonymous, which meant absolutely nothing to me. I just thought she was a bitch. And uh, so it, it, doesn't it stand to reason that the next time I met her, I fell desperately in love with her, right? <laughs> and we moved in together on our first date. And uh, then I began going to AA meetings with her because I have the disease of being the good guy. I'm riding in on my white horse. I will save you. I am the good guy. And I went to AA with her because she had a problem. I didn't, there was no reason for me to go. I didn't have a problem drinking. I could take it or leave it. But I was raised in a Southern Baptist home, so we go uh, sitting in the rooms and the steps and the traditions are on the wall and they, that God word would come up, you know, and I'd flinch a little bit, you know, because <laughs> of what that meant to me. But we used to go to a lot of 10 o'clock speaker meetings and they would, it would be candlelight. And there was something that would happen in those rooms with the laughter and the spirituality and the talking about God and the sharing, uh, the sharing uh, the AA members there. I hadn't been to Al-Anon at that point. But there was something about it that felt like home to me. Not like I, I knew it wasn't my place, but it just felt safe. It felt like home. And um, I was really sick. We, I hadn't been in that relationship but probably two minutes until we were riding around one day and I opened her. I have to tell you how sick I am if you aren't getting an idea yet. I opened her glove box and there were a 100 parking tickets in there. We weren't even living together yet. Well, we'd been dating like a week or two. A hundred parking tickets, and I went to work in my credit union and took out an $1,100 loan and paid all those parking tickets for her because I thought it was something that I should just do, right? Sick, sick, sick. Uh, <laughs> so, so it just got kind of worse from there. But uh, we were together, and she had a problem with anger, and I had a problem saying no. And, and she was just, I tell you what, she would walk in the room, and my heart would start to pound, and my hands would start to sweat. And I had a physical reaction to the alcoholic in my life, you know. So I, I don't have a physical allergy to alcohol, but sometimes I have a phys- physical allergy to alcoholics, you know. <laughs> so I can kind of understand a little bit ab- about, uh, you know, the phenomenon of craving. I can get that. It just doesn't happen to me when I take a drink in my body. And uh, it was very dramatic with us. And, and we started, it started getting kind of violent sometimes when she didn't know how to control her anger. And her sponsor came to me. God bless that woman, and suggested that I might try to go to Al-Anon. And uh, just because I wanted to make everybody happy, I said that I would go. And so I went to an Al-Anon meeting. Now, I've been going to a lot of 10 o'clock, you know, candlelight meetings of AA. And I walk into, and, and you know, that to me, like they were smoking, they were drinking coffee, they were laughing, they were having a good time. It's like a bar with no alcohol, right? And so then I go into this Al-Anon meeting, and there's like 50 people in this room sitting in a circle with Kleenex boxes in the middle, and they're crying, and they're talking about their feelings. And at the break, I shot out of there like, I don't want to be there. I just, can I stay here with you up here? She's uh, that's fine. So... I was getting pretty sick in this relationship, but I didn't know it. And I was sitting in a lot of the AA meetings, and I was listening to the steps. And things would soak in. You know, you get, I was getting it by osmosis, whether I wanted to or not, you know, because we went to a lot of meetings. I have to paint this picture for you because you certainly you don't know yet how sick I was. But and we had another roommate who had an issue with... Uh, she tried to commit suicide sometimes. And so, so this is our sober household. I would come home on a Friday night. My roommate would be laying on the floor and I would see how, just how deep she had cut her wrist before I go to the bedroom to have a big blowout, knockdown drag out with my partner before we go to the 8 o'clock AA meeting. And there's no drinking in our house, you know. <laughs> what I have to say is there may be sober households where that kind of stuff is happening here today. And we don't have to live that way anymore. There is a way out. We don't have to live that way. We have a solution. I didn't know there was a solution. I didn't even know how sick I was at that point, to tell you the truth. But life happened, and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And there were busted eardrums. There were broken windshields. There were, you know, fists through windows. There were emergency room trips just because she didn't want me to go back to work. And, you know, it just was crazy. It was insane. It was a roller coaster, high highs and low lows, and that was my life. And finally, at one point, I I had this suspicion that my partner was having an, an affair with our mutual best friend. But I wasn't sure. No one would tell me. And I had this feeling in my gut. But remember, I, I've learned long since not to trust what my guts are telling me. So I'm looking for you to tell me the truth. And no one's validating what I'm afraid of. And about this time, I was going to make a trip home. When I, was, when I was 12 years old, my father set me down and said, Carrie, there are three things that you can do that I will disown you for. Steal, love a black, or love a woman. 
And here is where I always say, I wish I had stolen my first girlfriend and she'd been black, but it wasn't the truth. <laughs> my first sponsor was black, but I don't think that counts. <laughs> uh, anyways, I went home and uh, I, honestly, I, could, I, I didn't have courage. I wasn't working the steps. I wasn't in a program. I was just kind of getting a little bit by osmosis, which is really dangerous, you know, when you're not, when you're not even in a program. You can sit in... They say that, you know, going, going to meetings and, and not working the step is like sitting in a garage and thinking you're a car, right? It doesn't make you one. <laughs> and I wasn't even saying I was in a program at that point, so I was really on the edges. But I told my new stepmother, this is how covert I was still. I said, what do you think my dad would do if, if maybe he were to think that I were gay? I couldn't even come out and say it, you know. And uh, what he did was, uh, he, I, I told her that right before I left to go back home at the end of my trip. And when I arrived back at Los Angeles, he had left a very long message on my answering machine and said, you're dead and buried as far as I'm concerned. You don't exist. I don't know what I did wrong, blah, 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 but don't come around me. I don't want to have anything to do with you. You don't exist. And that was just like someone cut my heart out because I was raised at blood sticker and water, and if you don't have family, what do you got? And, and my father had been like my higher power. Well, couple that sense of loss with the fact that my our other roommate confirmed for me that my partner was having an affair with our mutual best friend and that's when I hit my bottom I was spiritually bankrupt the lights were you could look at my eyes and you would see the lights were on but no one was home I was so desperate and so hopeless at that point uh, our roommate had been through a treatment program for um, codependency or al if you will and I was fortunate enough to get into that 21 day program because I knew that if I didn't go somewhere I was probably going to try and do something stupid like take my life. And that had never, until that moment, that had never happened to me. That I never had that thought. And that to me is like the first step because to ask for help. I knew that I was powerless and I had to do something. So I went to this treatment center and in essence, the professionals over 21 days made me put words to the things that had happened to me all my life. I had never been able to put the word rape with the, the event. And there's something about putting the words to the situations that make them real. And I think I hadn't been able to say them before because then I would have to deal with them. And I hadn't been able to say that my stepmother had abused me because if I'd have said it, I'd had to look at it. I couldn't look at it until now. I had to be locked up somewhere to look at it, you know. Thank God. And so we, I like to kid around and say that we had to do a family tree where he drew it out, the genealogy, and look at all the dysfunction. And then he had to put, I had to put colored lines around the different types of dysfunction in my family. And I had a freaking Christmas tree, all these different colored balls, you know. I mean, like some of them had five or six different colors around them, you know. It was pretty twisted. <laughs> but the good news was, excuse me, let me see how I had gotten so sick and that there was a way out. And at the end of the 21 days, they told me, they said, Carrie, we've shown you what the problem is. And now you need to go find a way of life. You need to find a spiritual way of life because your belief system is founded on lies. Well, if that doesn't wake you up, I don't know what will. You know, I mean, everything, everything I believe is founded on lies. Oh, great. What do I do now? You know, 7-Eleven doesn't have belief systems, you know. I mean, you can't just go buy them. <laughs> and so <clears throat> I had been to that al meeting. And to, to remember at this moment the arrogance with which I had left that al meeting that I literally crawled back into. They told me... You know, go ask those people for help. They will help you find a way to live. You have to find a spiritual basis for your life or you won't make it. So I went to Al Anon and I had, you know, I love the 90 meetings in 90 days that I heard him talk about in NAA. And so I went to 90 meetings in 90 days and I got a sponsor. And my sponsor told me I had to go to meetings, I had to call her, I had to work the steps, I had to be of service. And I did everything. She, I called her every day. I was so afraid that she wouldn't help me. I was so afraid not to do what she would tell me to do. And so I went to 90 meetings in 90 days. I took a day off and then I did another 90 and 90. And uh, <laughs> meetings was the only place I felt safe. At this point, you know, I, I was fortunate not to lose my job when I went to treatment. But the universe, sometimes I think almost has a twisted sense of humor because when I got out of treatment and went back to work, I worked in like a 12 by 12 room with white walls with an instrument um, in the sciences and me. And, and like, talk about being alone with your mind. Oh my God, it's a wonder I didn't go crazy. And I, I can remember I would cry on the way to work and I'd make a deal with myself that I could, if I could just work till lunchtime, I could cry all the way through lunch and then I knew I could go to a meeting when I got off work at night. Oh, the speaker was, the speaker was sharing last night about a teddy bear. <laughs> I can remember I had a teddy bear when I was, when I was first in program because I cried all the time and uh, they told me that when I finally left the relationship that got me there, it took a while that, that I just needed to, to let my feelings come. My sponsor asked me, 
what was my biggest fear? And I said that my biggest fear is being alone. No, I didn't leave that relationship when I first got into program. I was in program probably about 12 or 13 months before I got out of that relationship. I can remember we had a... This is so funny. When I look back now, it's like, oh my God, it's so sick. But we had been together a year and we had a, a cake for our anniversary. It had an AA and an al symbol in it and we had it at the bar when we were shooting pool, right? <laughs> <laughs> we were drinking. <laughs> Celebrate our anniversary in the bar. Perfect, you know? And, uh, and it seemed like that relationship lasted about 15 years and it lasted maybe 15 months at most. You know, I mean, just high drama all the time. I look back now, it's like, oh my God, how did I live? Because I have sponsees that my life is pretty boring today for the most part, you know, but I lived in such high drama, it would kill me today. The adrenaline of it, I just don't think I could handle it. I'm having some challenges now. We're moving right now into a new home, and the adrenaline of just things related to a move are overwhelming to me, you know, not to mention how, how my life used to be like that way all the time. But thank God I have steps and meetings today and prayer and meditation and things that keep me grounded. At any rate, when I got ready to leave that relationship, my sponsor said, what's your biggest fear? And I said, being alone. If I'm alone, I'll die. And I thought if I was alone, I would die because I didn't know how to go through life alone. I had no sense of who I was or what to do. I have to tell my second step story real quick. Uh, When I went into that treatment center, my insurance would only pay a certain amount for my treatment. And so they did all these negotiations. And the only way they would take me into treatment is for me to sign a paper to say that I would pay them $315 for 18 months. And I didn't think that I could afford that because I was, you know, supporting an alcoholic well beyond my means. <laughs> and I didn't have the money. But my sponsor, I mean, my partner pulled me out in the hall and said, my sponsor says if you, get, if you have money problems, you don't have problems. The most important thing is to stay alive. Sign the paper. You're going to die. So I signed the paper and I got out of the treatment center. You know, I already said I'm doing 90 meetings in 90 days. And, oh, thank you. I have one. And uh, so <laughs> I come prepared. And so uh, I got out of the treatment center and uh, I, I was just making it day by day, getting along, going to meetings at night, just, I mean, barely trying to keep my butt on, on me, you know. And so uh, I would go to the, I would call my sponsor and say, I don't know what to do about money. I'm juggling my bills. How do I get through this? She said, go to a meeting, pray to God and ask him to show you what to do. Well, I didn't have a God at that point because the idea of God that I knew was not, not fun. He was going to like make me burn in hell for who I was at my core. But my sponsor had a, an idea of a God that worked for her. I could look in her eyes and there was this thing about her. I didn't have a word for it then. <laughs> I know today's serenity, but I wouldn't have known if it hit me over the head. I thought she was boring, you know. But uh, <laughs> she had peace about her, but I couldn't identify peace because I didn't know what it was. It was foreign to me. And she let me use her higher power. So I would go to bed at night, get down on my knees, dear Stephanie's God, when I said my (laughs) prayers, you know. (laughs) And uh, so I said my prayers, and then I kept doing this, and I was juggling my bills, and I was just asking God to help me and show me the way, and really trying to understand that there could be a God that loved me, because I was having great difficulty getting rid of someone else's idea of God. And I went to the mailbox one day. It was the third month that I had sent my check into that treatment center, and I opened the mailbox. I still have this letter today. It says, Miss Keller, your hospital bill has been paid in full and we are returning the last check to us that you sent. And in that moment, I knew that something out there had to be on my side. I didn't know what to call it. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that something was in my corner. And it was just a little notch in the wall that had been built, had been built up against God, you know. So I kept going and, and I would still, like I think at first I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of Stephanie's God. And uh, she didn't care. She really didn't. And, and you know, I've loaned my God to, to people today. Oh, the teddy bear. When I, I remember I used to cry for like the first six months. And so they, I got a teddy bear and I named it Patterson. And it's so funny because I, I, this last week, I think, somebody brought Patterson back. And I give him to sponsees when they need him to, to, to when, when they need more love. Because this, this little bear has more love poured into it over 20-something years than I could even imagine. And the other day, Patterson came home and I was like, oh, good, somebody needs him. And he went right back out the door with another person that same day. <laughs> (laughs) So cool, because Patterson helps people, you know. I mean, it's just the love that we we give, and it's symbols that we use. But this program works. I can't even tell you how how full my life today is as a result of doing these steps, you know. Uh, At first, like I said, I turned my will and my life over to the care of Stephanie's God, and I needed her God at first. And then we had a group. She got all her sponsees together, and we went through a a four-step workbook, and we did the fourth step. And that was kind of frightening because I had only told professionals at that point some of the secrets that I had had. But when I did my fifth step with her, um, 
it was very frightening to me because I was so afraid that she was going to judge me for some of the, from the things that I had done and, and experienced. And she didn't look at me any different, and I watched. You know, every time I'd see her in a meeting, I'm looking, she's looking at me different. You know? <laughs> she could care less, but you know, <laughs> I know that today. But, uh, you know, she just loved me. And that experience that I had with my first sponsor was the first time I probably had experienced unconditional love. Because she didn't want anything from me. She just wanted me to get better. That's what I wanted. And she wanted me to do the things that she had done that helped her to get better. That's all she asked me to do. Nothing, she never asked me to do anything that she hadn't done herself, you know. <laughs> So we kept going through the steps, and I did the fifth step with her. And then to the best of my ability, I was entirely ready to get rid of the character defects that I had on a daily basis that I could. And some days I think I'm not, some of them I'm not entirely ready to get rid of because I still exhibit them. I don't know about you guys, but I still have some character defects. And uh, they raise their ugly heads some days more than I would like. Uh, particularly being judgmental, I get to work on that one. And uh, I think the, the more I've sought out the prejudices that I have, that remain in me, the, the bigger my heart becomes. Because when I can see where I'm prejudiced against something, my sponsor, my current sponsor, talks about how the fourth step is to help us find the ways that separate us from God. What ways do I still have self will that keeps me from God? And I look at the, if I look at the ways that I'm prejudiced, particularly against God or against religion or anything like that, when I can find what those prejudices are, then I can ask God to help me be relieved of them, and I can start to have more freedom, start to have more open mind. Because a closed mind is a terrible thing. And I got here with mine completely just slammed shut. Um, I humbly asked God to remove my shortcomings. And this is about the time I started deciding. This was so funny. I had left that relationship through no power of my own. God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And had my partner move like 80 miles away. And I tried to stay in that relationship. I would drive out there in the middle of the night and we'd fight. And I'd drive back. And I couldn't keep a job and do that very long. <laughs> but I tried. Oh, I'm so tenacious, you know. <laughs> And um, so I, I, I called my sponsor up and I said, I have a plan. And she just fell out laughing. <laughs> she said, okay, sister girl, tell me your plan. And I said, well, I, you know, I've been doing this thing all wrong. I've been putting the cart before the horse. I don't know how to date. I meet someone, I have lust for them, and I marry them, and I don't know who they are. So I'm going to try to back up and, and do this a little bit different and get to know people. And because I love the 30, 60, 90 thing that AA had going on, I said, well, I'm gonna, if I meet somebody and I like them, excuse me, I'm not going to kiss them for 30 days. And if I really dig them, I'm not going to have sex for 90 days. And she said, oh, okay. <laughs> you do that, honey. And uh, so I began to do this because I like, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm very linear, you know. But I'm also an al and I'm very linear. You know? <laughs> it fits well. Maybe I'm a scientist because I'm an al I don't know. It doesn't matter. But uh, I found out that water seeks its own level. And, I, and these women that I would become attracted to, when I would tell them my little plan, they just kind of hightailed it the other way. You know, I'm like, what's wrong with that? You know, well, you get what you're, what you find is what you're looking with, right? And so uh, the, the women were the same level that I was at. I kept working the steps, and eventually I began to learn that I could start to get to know someone. And that was a very frightening thing, to begin, begin becoming vulnerable with another human being, or getting intimate without sex, that scared me to death. Because I I don't know about you guys, but I was so dysfunctional. I could have sex with you, no problem. But to talk about how I actually felt, and to sit with you, and to be with you, that, that was more frightening to me than anything in the whole wide world. And I began to learn how to do that. And I got into a relationship with someone that was in the program. And it was a really good relationship until it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it was good. I'm sorry. I have to laugh sometimes. But uh, I was in that for a little while. And I moved, we moved to Boulder, uh, Colorado together. <laughs> Excuse me. We got to Boulder. Now, I had been living in Southern California for like 11 years. And I went to all gay and lesbian meetings because I could. They were everywhere all the time out there. Well, I went to Boulder. There were no gay and lesbian Al-Anon meetings. And I kind of freaked out a little bit because my father had disowned me. And I didn't know much about mainstream, you know. And so I was going to meetings. And uh, I was really scared. I didn't share a lot at first. And I thought, you know what? I hadn't been in Al-Anon long enough to know that if I don't come and be a part of and get in the middle of the wagon, they told me in the middle that it's hard to fall off the wagon if you're sitting in the middle of it. And I've done that from day one in Al-Anon. I knew I was sick enough I had to be right in the middle or I wasn't going to get well. And so when I got to Boulder, I would go to meetings and I signed up to uh, lead a speaker meeting. 
And I said, well, I'm going to find out where the rubber hits the road here. And I'm not going to change my pronouns. And I didn't. And people came up to me and they loved me. They didn't care. They loved me because I'd been affected by by alcoholism. They didn't care who my partner was. And being in that town for four years where I lived and being very involved in the program healed such a big part of my heart because I just I began to have a bigger family. You know, in Al Anon AA, we have a family here. And it, it was just, I can't even tell you how God worked in my life through the people in the rooms to help me heal from the stuff that had happened in my life with my dad. So then uh, I left that relationship because when I moved there, my partner stopped going to program. And eventually we grew apart. And I was sitting in meditation one day, and um, I realized that I couldn't sacrifice my spiritual welfare for the relationship anymore. And that meant that I had to leave. And in that, that day, I knew that I was committed to my own recovery because I knew that if I left that relationship, I was going to lose my home. I was going to lose my best friend. And I didn't have a place to live. But it didn't matter because I couldn't sacrifice my spiritual warfare anymore. And so I left and I didn't have a home. But uh, it didn't matter because my program friends gave me a place to stay. And I never went without a place to stay. And I never went without a meal. And everything worked out okay. But I believe that I had to get to the point of being willing to let everything go. To, to get everything, you know. Um, <clears throat> I got my own place, and I was living by myself for the first time and really enjoying life. I worked the steps. I had made amends to people. I have to tell you quickly, it took me a long time to figure out what my part in my resentment with my father was after he disowned me, and I realized that I had judged him for judging me. Excuse me. So I wrote my dad a letter, and the letter came back, returned to sender. It was kind of a blow. But my sponsor said, you were willing, just wait, and you'll know if it's time to try to do it again. And so eventually I did find out from my wonderful family that he had never got the letter because they always try to make make things right, you know. (laughs) And I sent the letter back. And uh, I didn't talk to my dad for a long, long time. And I probably about, well, getting ahead of myself. Let me back up here to say I was living in Boulder and was just waiting to find out, you know, whatever, if dad got the letter. And uh, I was going around speaking in conferences a little bit then because I was happy, in love with God, didn't need a relationship, all happy being single, you know. And I got asked to come and share in Reno, Nevada. And I met this little AA speaker, the, the spiritual speaker there at Reno. And I just, that morning that we were leaving after that conference was over, we met in the lobby. And I can't even explain to you, I've never had this happen in my whole life and may not ever happen again. But there was a moment of magic that happened with this human being we were in the middle of a casino and it was like everything in the world just melted away except this little humorous back and forth we were having. And uh, I wound up being in a relationship and in October I'll marry her. We've been together 10 years. (laughs) I wound up moving to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I wound up moving to Phoenix, Arizona. And why I would want to be leaving Boulder to go to Phoenix. It had to be a God thing because trust me, it's hotter than Hades in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> but it was where I was supposed to go. Obviously, it was what was supposed to happen. And when I left Boulder, um, I was getting ready to move down there. And one of my dearest friends, this is so wonderful, like a man that I would never have mixed with. Never. He's like, you know, older than me, Republican, Christian, like totally opposite. he become one of my closest friends. And when I got ready to move, he said, let me go with you. He said, I'll just drive my motorcycle in U-Haul. We'll pack your things around it, and I'll go with you, and I'll, and I'll ride my motorcycle back. And I'm like, well, why do you want to do that? He said, because I don't want you to go alone. How sweet was that? He'd become like my brother, you know, my own dad I couldn't have a relationship with. But God had given me the people that I need in my life, you know. So I moved to Phoenix and jumped right in down there. I got into service. Uh, you know, I, started, I was thinking last night, someone was sharing about a newcomer. I started a meeting at the Lambda Center when I arrived in Phoenix, and uh, it was at 6 o'clock. My partner's AA meeting was at 6 o'clock. I'm not well yet. I like to do things that work for me. And uh, <laughs> So I'm sitting in this meeting, and a lot of times there'd be no one there, but I committed to one year to do this meeting. And I can remember sitting in this meeting, and it's like 6.25. I mean, and I could, sit, I could hear them over there doing their step study. I could be sitting next door, and I thought, no, I'm going to sit here and read literature, and if, if, it, if no one comes, it's okay. I'm doing it to hold the space and for my own recovery. And I remember one night at like 6.28, this guy walked into that al room, a newcomer. And it was his first meeting. And we sat there and we had a meeting. And I know this gentleman today. And and he's in program. He's around program today. He stayed in for a while. I don't know if he goes a lot today or not. But if I had not been willing to sit there in that meeting, no one would have been there when he came. 
you know. And the miracle was I got to watch someone get into program and start to work recovery around that just because I was willing to do it. It's not because I have, there's nothing good about me about that except that I'm willing to go to any lengths for my recovery today to do the commitments that I say that I'm going to do, you know. I have a really strong home group in Phoenix. I do service a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I continue to work the steps. I pray and meditate on a daily basis. And I try to carry the message because I've absolutely had a spiritual awakening. I've had many spiritual awakenings. You know, just waking up in the morning is almost a spiritual awakening on some days because I'm so happy to be alive, you know. Um, There was something I was going to... Oh, I remember now. Um, A couple years ago, I was hiking... There's, the beautiful thing about Phoenix is there's mountain preserves all through the town. You can be hiking, you know, 10 minutes from where I live, and, and you're in a huge city, and you don't even know you are because you're in these mountains, and they're scattered all over. You know, think of Phoenix as being flat, don't you? But anyways, uh, I'm hiking, and I'm thinking, like, I want to be a better person. I work the steps to be a good human being. I want to have God use me as a channel of love. I mean, that's what's happened to me as a result of being in program. You know, I I sponsor a lot of people. I try to be of service in my community. I I just want to be in the flow of life today, you know. In the grocery store, in the bank, it doesn't matter. Just be a good human, you know. And it's amazing, like, when you smile at people and you're there and they look at you, like, this little thing happens. And to me, that's God. You know, kindness. When kindness occurs between people, to me, that's God. Hiking on the mountain one day and I thought, wow... Probably I could be a better daughter. I don't, this had to be God because I don't know where I wouldn't have thought that, you know. <laughs> but, and uh, I thought, wow, what can I do? Well, maybe I can like send birthday cards or Christmas cards to my dad, you know. So I thought, well, okay, I'll do that, right? So I come down off the mountain, and uh, you guys know that song by Mike and the Mechanics called "In the Living Years." It's a story about a man and his dad that are estranged, and he doesn't make amends to his dad, and his dad dies, and this whole story. It's very powerful. I haven't heard that song for like months. And I'm thinking about sending the cards. Get in the car. Turn the radio on. The song comes on. Like, oh my God. Okay, I'll buy a card. So, (laughs) well, I didn't. Okay. And I went to work the next day. And I'm sitting there working. I've forgotten about this. And that song comes on the radio again. I put my pen down. I went to Walgreens. And I bought a card. Okay. (laughs) Swear. Because, but you know, my higher power has some interesting ways of getting my attention. If I don't pay attention, sometimes they're like spiritual two-by-fours, you know. And I don't like the two-by-fours today. And so I sent cards for a couple years. I would send birthday cards and Christmas cards. And I'm not talking like all gushy. I'm talking about happy birthday dad. You know, I mean, just like real plain. Because I didn't want to be fake. I mean, why be fake? I sw- that, that wasn't in my makeup anymore. I, I did that. I didn't have to do that anymore. And after about two or three years, I went to the mailbox one day. It was around the time of my birthday. And I was getting, I don't know, I've met people, I've had the blessing of meeting people all over the United States from going and speaking at conferences. And I've made great friends that we still keep in touch with. So it's my birthday time and I'm getting cards and I pull this one card out. And a strange thing happens in my brain because some part of my brain recognizes his handwriting, but I can't make it out. And it's my dad. And I opened it up and he, he said, Dear Snookum, that's what he called me when I was a little kid. And I was like, just like a puddle, you know, just bawling my eyes out because here it's been like, Probably 12 or 14 years at that point since I had any interaction with my dad. And because I had been willing to listen to my higher power and send little, you know, cards, he was able to write me back. And a couple years after that, we kept doing that. Uh, I'm hiking again. I'm getting afraid to hike anymore, right? (laughs) I'm hiking and I get this thought like, well, maybe I should go see my dad because my parents, I mean, my family's told me that he's starting to, you know, his health is starting to decline. And uh, I thought, wow, it kind of would be stupid to, like, wait till he dies to go to his funeral because what's the point then? He's dead, you know. And uh, so I came home and I told Lori, I think I need to go see my dad. And she said, yeah, I think you do. And I'm like, crap, you know. Uh, (laughs) So I'm planning a trip home. and I was planning a trip home, and I called my dad and asked him if I could come and see him. And and he said that I could. And so I went to visit my other family in Mississippi, and I drove, like, three hours one morning down to meet my dad. And for the first time in my life, I sat across from this little man it used to be bigger than life and he was just a guy sitting at a breakfast table with cracker barrel you know and i sat across from him and he didn't have all the power anymore and i didn't care how he felt about me because i was sitting there a child of god in my own right and i knew that i'm a good girl today regardless of what he thinks 
because of you guys who've given me that. You know, I've showed up long enough and set up enough chairs and made enough coffee and done enough things to know that I have a place in the world. I have a seat here and you can't take it from me because I earned it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and you pull it out for me, you know. Please take your seat, you know. Uh, <laughs> because I'm crazy. No, um, I mean, I have a lot of serenity today, but I, I really owe my life to this program, you know. And when I sat across from my dad that day, and I could hold my head up and look at him and know that I was a fine human being regardless of what he thought. I knew that my recovery was happening for me. And I could love him that day regardless of what he felt. And I do. I love him today. I know he has a lot of uh, difficulties explaining how he feels or even being in touch with his feelings. And I feel compassion for my father today because I know what it feels like to be bound up in your emotions and not be able to feel. I have the gift of experiencing my feelings today even though I'm not thrilled with some of them sometimes, you know. <laughs> I can let them come and have them and let them move on. You know, um, one of the gifts of being in the program is that we get to watch other people grow and we get to watch other people go through their process and have their miracles. And I get courage from you and you get courage from me and we get courage just continuing to walk the road together, you know. I couldn't... If I spent the whole rest of my life trying to give back some of what I got, I don't think I'd make a drop in the bucket, but it doesn't mean I won't try. So grateful to be here. Thank you for sharing my recovery today.